for the misuse of anti-Semitism to silence criticism of Israel and promote anti-Arab and anti-Muslim racism. Um, so my name is Toby Kramer. I'm with the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. Um, and part of the reason that, well, IGN is kind of self-explanatory. We're a growing international network of Jews who oppose Zionism which we understand as the establishment, maintenance, and expansion of a Jewish state on Palestinian land. So we're utterly opposed to that. And specifically, part of why we're so, why we try to be active on this particular issue of the misuse of anti-Semitism, false accusations of anti-Semitism to try to silence the anti-Zionist movement and the Palestinian self movement. Yeah, so part of the reason IGEM specifically um, speaks out on this is that Aside from being used to silence legitimate resistance to, this, to Zionism and to the state of Israel, um, we object to the misuse of the actual history of anti-Semitism, the actual history and um, legacies of persecution and oppression of Jewish peoples for the purposes of oppressing and targeting Palestinians and other people. Um, and we completely reject those histories being used that way. Um, and that is part of our independent complaint against Zionism and, and these attacks. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to the other panelists to introduce themselves as well. We're gonna talk about the context of what, um, of how come there's the use of, the misuse of anti-Semitism to silence criticism, the context that that's taking place in. Um, but I also wanted to point out that there's a sign-in sheet going around. So if you want to continue the conversation, if you want to, um, we can we'll mention different resources throughout the course of this presentation, and we can follow up and share some of those resources if your name is on that sign-in. So I will pass this along to Max and Louise. I guess you can get Hi, I'm Max Geller. I, uh, I'm from Boston. I organize with Northeastern University Students for Justice in Palestine, and I'm very happy to be here. Good morning. Wow. I, will, I will project. I'm just uh, finding my sea legs. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Lemmy Steek. I am a Palestinian uh, living in New York. I am in, uh, born in Palestine, living in New York. I'm a practicing and much of my practice revolves around defending Arab Muslim communities um, and individuals and organizers who've come under criminal or civil attack by anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian uh, civil and governmental repression. I'm also a very long time activist and organizer in the Palestinian and Arab and Muslim communities. Uh, I'm affiliated with several organizations, the National Lawyers Guild, the Council on American Islamic Relations, and Aouda the Palestine Right to Return Coalition. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. And I just want to point, I'm sorry, George, but you did a fantastic job kind of setting the stage for what needs to happen in terms of um, redefining language and kind of understanding what our role here is. I know this is not a Palestine solidarity mm -hmm. panel, but in supporting the Palestinian struggle and that, and that this um, understanding of taking back um, the language and our struggle away from uh, you know, some, the, the framework of anti-Semitism um, I think is really important, and I, I hope that some of that continues to happen today. And thank you to iGen. So. So this is a incredibly racist image, and this is a, a cartoon that was used. This was uh, one of someone in student government in one of the California universities. Um, put this on their, on their personal Facebook page. This is uh, e exactly how Zionists attempt 
to characterize the campus movement against Zionism and the campus movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. So you'll see over here, well, I'm pointing to that, like you can see that. You'll see over here, Israel equals apartheid. So that is a legitimate critique of Israel, that Israel is an apartheid state. That's not, that, according to the definitions of apartheid, is not a particularly controversial statement. And then immediately from that, they go to Zionism is Nazism. Hitler should have finished the job. Violence against Zionists. So those are absurd, those, those claims are not part of the BDS movement, and you can see that it's incredible, the racist depiction of the um, anti-Zionist students here as a complete caricature, um, and then also that the administration would be protecting them. It's really absurd, but this is the kind of rhetoric that we're up against. This is what the student movement actually looks like. Um, divestment, it's grassroots, there's a lot of different people involved. This is a very, um, you know, the tone is completely different. The focus here is not on, it, the focus here is not on Jews. It's on what's happening in Palestine. It's about the boycott movement in general, and it's, and it's for divestment. Um, so to back up where that cartoon is coming from, a lot of times there seem to be these different organic um, expressions of, that are attempting to silence the movement for BDS. They actually, they're not necessarily coordinated. They come up in different areas in some ways independently, but it's actually part of a much larger top-down strategy and a much larger project um, that has a lot of... Uh, that's gaining a lot of currency for, a, for people who support Israel. So part of where this comes from is in 2010, the Rayu Institute, which is um, an Israeli think tank that ends up shaping a lot of Israeli policy, published a report called the Delegitimization Challenge. Um, in it, they talk about the, so what they mean by delegitimization, delegitimization of Israel is that is the people who don't think that it's legitimate to have a settler colonial state on Palestinian land and who don't think that apartheid is legitimate and how those viewpoints are gaining a lot of currency and gaining a lot of momentum um, and support. So this quote from it is incredibly telling because often the often what's used to try to silence supporters of the Palestinian movement is that they're anti, is that it's fueled by anti-Semitism. But here, the Rayu Institute says clearly that it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict serves as the engine driving the criticism. So they're completely clear that it's not actually anything to do with anti-Semitism that's driving criticism of Israel. And of course, when they use the language of Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we understand that to be the conflict between colonizers and people uh, resisting colonization. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily characterize it as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but we, but they're entirely correct that 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 is what is driving the criticism as opposed to um, anti-Jewish sentiment. So what the misuse of how the misuse of anti-Semitism is used, or some features of it, and we'll, this will be revealed more in concrete examples throughout the presentation, is um, any criticism of Israel is inherently said to be anti-Jewish because there's this Zionist project of conflating Zionism with Jewishness. So if you're Jewish, you're automatically um, folded, you know, the attempt is to fold, automatically fold all Jews into the project of Zionism and then therefore be able to claim anti-Semitism if Zionism is criticized. This, as we said before, exploits and dishonors the actual history of anti-Jewish racism and persecution. Um, it also is a claim of racism and discrimination in defense of actual racism. So for example, in a Calif there was a California campus climate hearing session that happened recently that was convened because a black student was targeted in an incredibly violent and racist way where um, people actually physically put a noose around his neck, um, which is a really alarming, disturbing, and appropriate that there be campus climate hearings to address that level of racism. What ended up happening at those campus climate meetings was that Tammy Rossman Benjamin, who's a very um, 
active Zionist uh, force unto herself in some ways, showed up with a bunch, like maybe 12 white Jewish students, and they totally took the meeting in the direction of talking about their feelings, uh, what it feels like for them, how they feel unsafe when Israel is criticized on their campus, which is a complete, so not only is that an absurd misuse of accusations of anti-Semitism, it's actually getting in the way of dealing with actual racism that is actually happening on campuses. And that is also completely outrageous. Um, so that sort of speaks to the last point. Um, oh, and claiming racism in defense of racism is that, of course, it, Zionism itself is completely racist. So that just bears underlining. Um, so the Radio Institute is responding to what they call the existential threat. Um, they're acknowledging that boycott, divestment, sanctions, and that other types, other movements uh, in support of Palestinian self-determination do literally threaten, uh, do literally pose an existential threat to the settler colonial state of Israel. And here you can see the recommendation is to focus intelligent, intelligence agencies on this challenge. So using the state of Israel, the state apparatus of Israel, the state apparatus of the United States, and of Zionist organizations that function as an extension of those state interests um, against what they're calling the delegitimization threat. This is completely consistent with Zionism um, the form of Zionism that emerged as the dominant form that we have to deal with today, which was um, Herzl and Jabotinsky uh, working from that framework. Um, the concept of the Iron Wall, and I just want to read a quotation from Jabotinsky, who's one of the founders of the type of Zionism that ended up emerging, which is, um, he wrote a position paper which said, very clearly that no matter if you're moderate or extreme, no matter what your position on Zionism is, you need to understand that no indigenous population has ever stopped resisting colonization under any circumstances and that you need to factor that into the project of Zionism. He was very clear on what, on what Zionism meant. Um, he you know, obviously ended up on the wrong side of that but his analysis of the situation of what, they were, of what the project was, was clear. So he said, this iron wall concept is only when not a single breach is visible in the iron wall, only then do extreme groups lose their sway and influence transfers to moderate groups. Only then would those moderate groups come to us with proposals for mutual concessions. And only then will moderates offer suggestions for compromise on practical questions like a guarantee against expulsion or equality and national autonomy. So only when he describes this as an iron wall, this is literally a wall that there is, but it's also a wall around um, what the terms are. It's a wall around what tactics are completely policed and target, targeted um, for um, trying to be made impossible. So in that context, um, okay. Well, I'll get, to the delegi I'll get to the way they're trying to, to um, put a wedge between people who criticize Israel and people who think Israel is not a legitimate project in a moment. But just to say that they understand this iron wall both as tactical and ideological. Um, Israel's homeland security industry, which is a major player um, internationally, is an extension of this Zionist philosophy of the iron wall. So they are leading the field, very proud that they're leading the field in um, what they call the homeland security industry, which is surveillance systems, biometric surveillance systems, drones. Israel is a, is a significant leader in the technology of drones. Um, and here they are even advertising, this is from a website from Israeli trade, um, an Israeli trade website, Israeli government, no other country has been able to field test its systems and solutions in real-time situations. They're literally boasting about their treatment of Palestinians in the occupied territories and in, um, in other places. So, and they're using that to advertise to other repressive regimes and um, police states internationally. So this is getting back to the Ray Institute 
report, which is that iron wall, that homeland security systems, that entire orientation to the world of completely trying to squelch any level of resistance, to literally trying to exterminate it, um, is the iron wall and is what the Ray Institute is suggesting, suggesting be also turned to um, the delegitimizers. Um, and they are correct in the effective mobilization against apartheid South Africa as inspiration. That is part of the inspiration of the boycott, divestment, sanction movement. And there are, uh, it's definitely a very different situation in Palestine in a lot of ways. But in the success of the boycott movement to have a very serious impact in isolating the apartheid state, that is a valid comparison. Um, the other piece that's really telling about what the Ray Institute report strategy, which informs a lot of the other Zionist organizing strategy, is that the delegitimization network, so in other words, anti-Zionists, aim to supersede the Zionist model with a state that is based on the one person, one vote principle. So they understand our movements to be pro-democracy pro and pro-self-determination, and they understand that their side will always inherently have to oppose that and be against that. Um, right, so we, and, and they say negate Israel's right to exist based on a variety of political and philosophical arguments, and then, in other words, democracy. Um, so isolating the delegitimizers, this is exactly the language that we heard in Jabotinsky describe the ideological and um, tactical iron wall. Israel should engage its critics while isolating the delegitimizers. So by attempting, so by making dialogue groups, making certain conversations that are within the Oslo framework, that are within the sort of two peoples engaged in conflict conversations, um, Zionists actually put funding towards those conversations or trying to make those conversations happen on campuses so that there's a very limited range of critique that is, that there's a lot of um, effort being put into making appear acceptable to further marginalize, to further frighten people away from actually talking about what's going on is in terms of a settler colonial state, in terms of an apartheid state, um, and in terms of Zionism and uh, white supremacy. So, is, so that is part of the idea to drive a wedge and isolate, marginalize, and make it seem like parts of the movement are too radical. Um, getting into some of the brass tacks of how, of what this strategy entails, um, literally targeting people. Um, they talk about hubs and catalysts. So hubs are places where there's a lot of activity that supports Palestinian self-determination and the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. And catalysts, are, they say units of the network, but what they mean by units are people um, who dedicate themselves to this cause and um, they're really willing to stop at nothing to target these, these catalysts, like personally threatening people, following people, showing up places, defamation, um, you know, using cyberbullying, and um, Max and Lamis can both speak more to what some of that targeting looks like. Can I just say, yeah. uh, when the Israeli Consular General of Boston came to Northeastern, uh, I had uh, eventually, I, I convinced uh, my university that as a student, there is no grounds for them to deny me entry. And so I went in, and one of the first things the consular general said to the assembled student, uh, Zionist students in Boston, was uh, there is no reason uh, to let Boston become. And he, said, he mentioned he, uh, clearly uh, this uh, root paper uh, got around because he said, I will, not on my watch will Boston become a London, a Paris, a Toronto, or a Madrid. Boston will not become San Francisco while I am uh, the Consular General of Israel. And then uh, the, the implication being that if it seems like it's going to become, we will target the individuals, uh, the driving force behind the uh, radicalization of uh, Boston students. Absolutely. So. I mean, part of what this means is that in another part of the Ray Institute report, they describe that Zionist and Israel, Israel tends to work from 
from the center to the periphery or top down, emphasizing former relations between political and business elites, focusing on mainstream media, and often being guided by the mindset that if you are not with me, you are against me. On the other hand, Israel's delegitimizers work from the periphery to the center and bottom up, focusing on non-governmental organizations, academia, grassroots movements, and the general public, using social networks and being guided by the mindset that if you are not against me, you are with me. So again, I might use slightly different language in that, but they're very clear that what we are is grassroots and they're trying to mimic. They are not in fact a grassroots movement, but they're trying to mimic grassroots movements in order to sort of um, be able to confront us on the, on the terms and on the ground that we are inevitably going to be more successful than they are, which is the grassroots. Um, so this Israeli act Israel Action Network is part of their attempt to appear of grassroots. Um, it's a strategic initiative of the Jewish Federations of North America, which is a powerful Zionist institution in partnership with the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. And then you'll notice, I think it's just worth pointing out that these are both described as Jewish organizations. They're Zionist organizations. Um, and their attempt, and they're calling themselves Jewish so that they can claim to speak for all Jews. It's simple, and I think there are ways we get used to seeing that, but I do think it's worth pointing out that they are not Jewish per se, but they are Zionist. Um, for Jewish Zionists, I'm not saying they're not full of Jewish people. Um, so this was a six million dollars at launch. It's now has about 300 million invested in it from 100 million from the state of Israel and 200 million from US Zionist organi organizations. But it's called the Action Network. It's, it's totally trying to appear to be grassroots. Um, and it's about gleaning and sharing intelligence, organizing and mobilizing. So, Max, I think you can speak some to what that looks what that looks like. Sure. Uh, this is uh, the term will uh, that I think is a helpful term to use here is the oh sorry thank you uh, is, is the astroturfing of pro-Israel activism in America, and that uh, that two hundred million dollars that uh, Toby just spoke about uh, comes from five sources, only five. Um, and some of the people, uh, you know, it'll make me want to spit, but I'll try and avoid doing so. But we're talking about the Koch brothers, who I count as one person. Uh, we're talking about Sheldon Adelson. We're talking about the Chernick family out in Oregon, who run the Fairbrook uh, uh, group. And we're talking about the billionaire investor in Boston, Seth Clareman. Um, those, uh, uh, there's one more. The um, Moskowitz out here in New York, but I don't really, in any case, uh, these, this $200 million, can you go to the yeah. uh, next slide? Um, oh no, s s stick with Israel Campus Coalition, okay. sorry. No worries. Um, uh, this $200 million uh, plays out in a really interesting way. Uh, the Middle East Forum, Daniel Pipes' uh, racist vehicle to attack all things Islam uh, receives the uh, entirety of his operating funds from grants from these five major donors, as does Pam Geller's ads, as does the sort of uh, at Northeastern University when we had a uh, the beginnings of a uh, when we deigned to walk out of a uh, the, the Zionist group stand with us who. Um, some people in the room might know, but who also reserve, uh, receives the bulk of its operating funds from Seth Clareman and Sheldon Adelson, uh, brought on uh, the, the week where the Holocaust was being remembered. Again, a very clear and disgusting attempt to conflate Judaism with uh, the Israeli settler colonial project, brought is active duty Israeli soldiers to campus on Holocaust Remembrance Day. And uh, students, including myself and Tori, who's in the room, um, organized a walkout, a traditional nonviolent walkout of these Israeli soldiers. Uh, following that walkout, um, there were 30 articles in 20 different um, news sources, all of which, all of which, all 20 of these uh, 
media outlets from PJ Media to Pam Geller's Atlas Shrug to the Times of Israel uh, wrote very similar articles defaming us, uh, defaming and, and, and charging uh, Northeastern with fostering an anti Semitic climate on campus because uh, students walked out of an Israeli soldier event and disrupted Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, the, it started to really seem, especially for the administration, like there was a grassroots movement because 30 different articles in 20 different papers couldn't possibly be a, uh, uh, a coincidence, right? There must actually be an anti-Semitism problem. And so the university sanctioned us. And this is only, uh, this is the, the sort of first stage in uh, the censorship of Northeastern Students for Justice in Palestine, but it came on the, on the heels of a AstroTurf campaign to make it seem like uh, the Jewish community in Boston was outraged and concerned about anti-Semitism at Northeastern, when really it was five plutocrats uh, upset at uh, the position we were taking. But it, it, it sure seemed like a litany of complaints. Um, Please, yeah. Um, within six months of our uh, initial sanction, we were suspended. And on the day our suspension uh, went into effect, the Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, another one of these organizations which receives, uh, and this is all a matter of public record, their 5013Cs are available uh, for public viewing because it's our money that they're uh, not paying to, uh, we're the ones subsidizing their, their tax exempt status. Um, the Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law opened a new chapter at Northeastern University. And uh, their, um, their, their sole tenant is uh, to equate, quote, anti-Israelism with anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, as you can see, they're willing to engage in sort of what we know as lawfare to um, to silence critics, uh, the uh, one of the uh, bulletin boards that SJP at Northeastern had access to, um, uh, we put up a sign that said, "Judaism is a medic religion. Zionism is an exclusionary political ultranationalist ideology. Criticizing Israel for Zionist policies is not anti-Semitism." That's what the bulletin board said. And uh, the Brandeis Center received, because of uh, members of the Northeastern faculty are part of the Israel Campus Coalition, they, re uh, they received a photograph of this bulletin board. And that photograph was used in a threat letter to the university administration threatening a Title VI complaint. Um, and I, I think uh, t Title VI is a sort of civil rights uh, uh, the, the law that came out of the civil rights movement to ensure that there would be no more uh, institutionalized bigotry on campuses. And so we see the sort of use by Zionist groups of uh, cynically manipulating the civil rights movement to silence criticism of colonial policies. Um, the, uh, the, the letter, uh, uh, what came from the Israeli, uh, the, the Brandeis Center and the Zionist Organization of America's uh, human rights under law uh, wing of the ZOA. And uh, copied on the letter sent to our administrator was none other than the uh, biggest donor to Northeastern. Uh, he has, uh, he is a living man with a life-size statue of himself on campus and several buildings named after him. Uh, <laughs> I, I shit you not. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the bronze statue is him cradling a cat. And he received, he along with the president of the university received this letter alleging a hostile environment for Jewish students on campus. And the fact that this donor, the biggest donor to our school was talking about, it was, it was really weird to me until I found out that uh, the same man, the same man of, of, who, of cat statue fame, is has given six figures to the ZOA itself. So the uh, 
uh, as Toby indicated, the Zionist Organization of America. Does he have a name? Oh, he has a name. Uh, his name is Robert Shulman, um, and he is a uh, monstrous man. Um, <laughs> and he, uh, I, I think Toby's point earlier about the uh, iron wall moving from top down is really uh, uh, crystallized by the case in Northeastern. You have uh, an attempt to reach the most important donors to our school, and uh, you know, as everyone knows, uh, with the corporatization of uh, universities, donations, especially six-figure ones, uh, are the lifeblood of the university. And so it's no surprise that uh, Northeastern SJP was censored and suspended because uh, there was a, uh, a lot of money invested in uh, making that happen. Yeah. Um, so this is speaking again to some of what that money and making it happen is Zionist organizations and corporations. Just to name explicitly two of the forces besides the State of Israel and the United States that are part of these coordinated efforts um, to silence opposition. So how we define Zionist organizations and corporations are organizations and corporations that economically and politically support the maintenance and expansion of a Jewish state in historic Palestine. So that last part, maintenance and expansion of a Jewish state in historic Palestine is Zionism, and I think it's also really important to see that there are, like the Jewish Federation and the Jewish Council for Community Relations, or those organizations, are politically in support of the state of, of Zionism, and because of the homeland security industry that, I, that we mentioned earlier, there are a lot of corporations who are, their political interest is nothing more than the profit that they can make. Israel, well, Palestine specifically as a laboratory for not only pushing the envelope in terms of what technologies <laughs> they can invent and use, but also pushing the envelope in terms of what corporations and states can get away with. Um, it, and, and then sort of lowering and lowering the bar for, for human rights internationally. So this is also something that's available that goes more into that because there are corporations like you know, G4S is a really good example, security systems, um, or Elbit is a good example. Elbit created the wall, is part of the corporation that created the uh, apartheid wall in Israel and also the wall of death on the US-Mexico border. So they don't particularly, I mean, I'm sure they, they are probably more conservative individually and probably do align more with state powers like Israel and the United States, but essentially they are profit driven and war, perpetual warfare and perpetual um, police surveillance and repression of human populations is a very profitable industry right now. So it's, it's, that's, that's a piece of it too that we can't leave out and just think that it's Zionist organizations. Um, so this is also available, it, it talks more about those things. Um, what these, so these are different I guess what to distinguish too between the economic interest and the political interest, it's not that they're so very different. It's that organizations, state powers, and corporations end up working together because of shared interests. So it's not necessarily like they're meeting in a back room somewhere and getting on the same page, although stuff like the Reut Institute report is useful to all of them, and they often do get on the same page, but it's because of these shared interests. What that looks like practically is that Zionist institutions, including the Anti-Defamation League and other organizations that are um, not, well, I, I won't say they're not state affiliated, but they, it's not just the state of Israel, trains police, military, and National Guard in population control. Um, there's, FEMA is also like trained by the IDF at some times. Um, a lot of police are trained by the IDF. Uh, All of the people who search you at the airport receive their training from the IDF. Mm -hmm. um, providing technology, products, and strategies. Fueling anti-Arab and anti-Muslim policies and climate is essential to what their projects are. Um, providing technology, materials, and planning for militarized borders. <clears throat> Justifying attacks on First Amendment and civil rights. That's also about creating a climate in which they're able to get away with and do what it is that they want to do. 
and threaten the funding of community organizations. There are several examples from the Bay Area, which is just what I'm familiar with. I know this happens all over. Uh, for example, San Francisco Women Against Rape um, came out with a statement that was against the colonization of Palestine. And a group of Zionist organizations um, organized to contact all of their funders and try to get all of their funding taken away um, just completely trying to pu punish them, not only materially by taking away their funding, but by then diverting all of their energy and resources to trying to fight, you know, defend themselves. Um, and it's just, it's San Francisco women against rape. Like, anyone is a fair target for the Zionists. There's, they will really stop at nothing. Um, so the U.S. government, Homeland Security grants, gives money to, quote, anti-terrorist funding, uh, anti-terrorist anti organizations, which anti-terrorist could be another really, is clearly part of the Zionist project, that kind of um, racist language. Um, so you can see here from these graphs that U.S. tax dollars are going directly into the hands of Zionist organizations. It's not where they receive all their funding, but it also just holds up the lie again that these Zionist organizations are in any way legitimately grassroots. They, they absolutely are not, are not that. Um, I don't know if to, okay, for the surveillance. Sorry. So, 80, the Anti-Defamation League has participated in the surveillance of over 1,000 <laughs> social justice and human rights organizations. Um, including the anti-apartheid South African movement, United Farm Workers. Um, you can see here from the list that they understand that all of these, all of these different organ, all of these different causes, are have a vested interest in opposing everything that the Zionists have and have a vested interest in building. So they understand the connections. They understand that we are in joint struggle with each other, that we understand the ways that we can weaken corporations through the United Farm Workers helps our cause. They, they see those connections in the same way that we do, and so they show up every place that they are. Um, it's also this somehow I think we sometimes kind of are getting used to in some ways, these like absurd, flagrant abuses of our of our rights um, with the NSA, but the US shares raw intelligence information with Israel. That's, I, I feel like in some ways that's like not surprising because we understand a lot about the US-Israel relationship, but they're giving just information about, I mean, we all know that like citizen, like all these things are like kind of this, not things that we can rely on, that the state is not necessarily there to protect our interests or protect us in any way, but this is like a really shocking level of collaboration um, that is happening. And then to that point, um, please collaborate. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, in fact, one of the WikiLeaks, um, some of the WikiLeaks documents reveal uh, Danny Ayalon and various Israeli officials thanking Hillary Clinton for allowing uh, them to access their NSA files directly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't often disagree with the great folks at iGen. I do, however, disagree on one thing that Toby said, which is, which is that they don't sit in a room together and collaborate no, right. specifically on this. No, that is true. absolutely not the case. They do, <laughs> in fact, sit together in a room um, and collaborate on this. And when I say they, I mean Zionist organizations, um, the Israeli government officials directly, and their proxies, um, and our legislators, our police departments, our uh, federal enforcement agencies, our prosecutors. I know this for a fact. Um, and uh, because it's impossible to do the work that I've done and be so in touch with the community and what, what happens to them and, and see what the prosecutor's office or the NYPD is doing, for example. So I am. Uh, very certain, and if we look mm -hmm. at patterns, it is very clear that there is a room in which they sit together and they decide who and how to prosecute, which uh, mechanisms of repression to implement, when to implement them, and that's identifiable, and I'll get back to it. I do want to take it a step back, and if that's okay, yeah, and, yeah. and you're going to cut me off when I, I, you need to, please, because I'll go over time. 
So, you know, the, the idea of the delegitimization network, I think that that's a very important um, a place to start because despite its massive weaponry, despite uh, its immeasurable human and financial resources, um, direct and indirect, and its collaboration with the American government and its project and European governments and their imperialist projects, um, Israel continues to struggle with its own legitimacy. Its essential struggle is its struggle for legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So they have the weapons, they're stealing the land, they're killing the people, yet they have not won that legitimacy. And that is really the crux of the Israeli struggle. Um, and that has shaped, uh, of course, I mean, that, that brings a, a dialogue, that creates a dialogue between the Israelis and the, and, and the Palestinian resistance, right? The Israeli oppression and the Palestinian resistance is shaped by this, you know, uh, demand to recognize us, right? Because that's still the demand and, and part of the, the, you know, the, the piecemeal, uh, negotiations or whatever is you know we demand that you recognize this and I think that that's a very important point um, and the o and the only Palestinians who could uh, or, or even Arabs really if you look at the region and the role that Israel has played in the Arab world um, who can accept the legit legitimacy of a settler state of colonization or people who are suicidal and are basically saying we accept we not only uh, accept your, your, your colonization, right, de facto, because there is a de facto, we, we, we exist under it, we realize it's there, we not only accept it, but we acknowledge it as the right thing to do, and that's why there is this constant struggle, you know, and, and it's not going to be resolved, of, of we refuse to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, because then we are saying that we acknowledge uh, your right to colonize us, not just that you do colonize, but but we acknowledge your right that the land is Jewish, it is only Jewish, and we acknowledge your right to have it as such, and therefore you tell us what to do with what we are as Palestinians, uh, Arab, uh, Arabs, Christians, whatever. So the, legitimate, the, the, the struggle for leg legitimacy is very important. So when we talk about the delegitimization network and the fact that millions, if not billions of dollars have been poured into countering the delegitimization network, it's for good reason. This is the crux of, of the struggle. Uh, and this also then defines what is acceptable for, what are acceptable forms of resistance by anti-Zionist Jews, by Arabs and Palestinians. Um, and to contextualize it very briefly, and I'm sorry, um, you know, the, the, uh, the delegitimization network, the Islamophobia network, you know, all has its roots in the Orientalism, in, in Orientalism, which was used as a tool to expand and affect and implement colonialism, um, you know, and Orientalism spiked, of course, through the centuries, but, you know, in the 1970s, Sesame Street was putting up a photograph of an Arab to teach children the word danger, right? Yes, right? If, if, for those of you who are old enough, if you look, remember the bugs, and, and uh, there's this Mossad, Mossad run group that makes fun of me for saying this, um, but if you look at Bugs Bunny, cartoons, if you recall the Bugs Bunny cartoons, right? It's not the Muslim who's the bad guy, it's the Arab or the, uh, the uh, West Asian looking man or woman who's got the turban, right, and he's got the sword and he's chasing the women and trying to kill them, right? So he's violent and hedonistic, right? Um, and that happened to be the same time that there was also very intimate collaboration between the US government, the FBI, the executive office, Nixon and the Israeli government. Um, now the government, the, is, the American government has long been cooperating and, uh, and coordinating with the Israeli government and our interest in, well, American interest in the Israeli government dates back to the 1940s, even before it became uh, Israel. But it, it really, uh, it escalated when European power waned in, in the region and Israeli, uh, Israeli power established itself militarily in the 1967 <coughs> war, and the U.S. saw it as a very strategic time to kind of establish its presence in the region. And so by the 1970s, we had a very symbiotic, intimate relationship between the American government and the Israeli government. Um, operation Boulder was uh, you know, an operation launched by Nixon at the time, 
and he had you know, tasked the FBI with finding, rounding up, uh, arresting, and deporting Palestinian activists and activists in solidarity with Palestine. That same year, the McCarran Act essentially made it illegal to distribute flyers in support of Palestinian uh, resistance, for example. And we saw the case of the LA-8 come out of that. Um, 19, by the, you know, 1996, yeah, it's really interesting, um, you know, this constant using of, of the cover of uh, terrorism and Islamophobia for expanding what, what somebody at, at our last panel said, for expanding the Israel, Israelization of uh, U.S. security, for, uh, for Israelizing not only U.S. security um, and it, its execution, but also legislation. Um, and the implementation of that legislation. 1996, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which supposedly was in response to the 1996 Oklahoma bombings by Timothy McVeigh, a white person, um, and expanded the use of secret evidence. Well, the first and longest held prisoners under these provisions happened to be Palestinian. Three years uh, without charges and under secret <coughs> evidence. Mazen Najjar, and I forget the other man's name. Um, you know, 9 11, the, the Israeli response, Netanyahu's response to 9 11 was that it was a good thing, which he later retracted. I mean, that was his immediate response, was that it was a good thing. And immediately we saw the shutting down of almost every Palestinian. Uh, run organization that supported Palestinian work, right? It wasn't an attack on the, Af not that there should have been, on Afghani or Saudi organizations, but on Palestinian organizations, and that's not coincidental. Um, and that's because, you know, 2003, the Department of Homeland Security decided to institutionalize its relationship, um, to institutionalize the Israelization of U.S. security by opening up an office in Palestine, in Jerusalem, with the Israeli government. So we actually have the Department of Homeland Security office. And now we also have an NYPD office located in Jerusalem. And therefore, it is no coincidence to know that um, the CIA had been collaborating with the NYPD um, in coordination uh, with the Israeli occupation forces to uh, create a new unit, a new method of operation to surveil and monitor Arabs, Muslims, black Muslim communities, Asian Muslim communities, uh, modeled on the Israeli occupation forces model of mapping and surveilling Palestinians in the West Bank. So when we say the Israelization and the militarization of the NYPD and police forces, it's the most literal uh, meaning of the words. Um, I, I want to bring, I don't know how much time do I have oh, left. You have more time, time, yeah. Okay. So, so, so we, we started with the Orientalism, right, I, 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 as a cover for... Is that helpful, that side? Stuff? Which side? I don't... It's okay to me. Okay. Right. With, with, with the decline of, of Arab nationalism um, as, as the heart of resistance to colonialism and as the heart of the resistance to Israeli expansionism and occupation and the rise of um, Muslim and Islamist movements as, as the, the leading force in the resistance to you know, proxy colonialism, imperialism, and certainly in the resistance to Israeli occupation, the response was the, 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 you know, the beginning of the Islamophobia movement, which is, you know, I remember in the 90s or you know, early 2000s, the, the idea, you know, the doctrine of clash of civilizations, um, you know, jihad versus McDonald's, that was really the beginning of, of um, the new doctrine on justifying continued expansionism, Israeli and US or Western imperialist expansion in, into the US. And all of this revolves around social vilification. Um, and that's a very important aspect of, of the Israeli you know, normalization project of the Israeli agenda is to socially vilify not just the Palestinians, but anybody who comes in solidarity with them. And it, it was never sufficient to say that it was just the Palestinians, because the Palestinians are too small and too limited a group of people to say that they are the problem. 
Um, and we're, we're small and limited not only in number, but also in location. And so not enough people have come into contact. So it's always better to say that it's the whole of the Arab world, the 22 countries, when that was no longer sufficient. So then it became you know, the one billion Muslims around the world that are a threat. And that all falls into the framework of the eternal victim fighting this eternal threat that is you know, everywhere. It can't be controlled. And it's something that the West can relate to um, on some level. So it's not an unintentional consequence, but a very intentional one. And when we look at um, the Islamophobia network and the Islamophobia industry, uh, aside from what they've discussed, and Max will discuss more after me, but of the 12 primary Islamophobia movements, runners, you know, the, the real owners, the, the thrust of the movement, of those 12, seven of them are Zionist groups. Four of them are dispatched directly from Israel. And that's tremendous, right? Um, there's 37 groups, half of them are Zionist. Of the top 12, seven are, are, are Zionist, four of which are dispatched from Israel. So there's a symbiotic and cyclical relationship between um, civil and, you know, I don't know if we can even call a lot of these groups NGOs, and maybe we need to consider um, exposing and deconstructing the role of the Israeli government in building and proliferating them, because at mm -hmm. which point they're not NGOs if they are being directed um, by the Israeli government or its agents. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. Um, I don't know which cases to highlight, really, um, the NYPD <laughs> cases. Um, but but there, there's a lot. I mean, everything from, you know, post 9-11, we didn't, uh, after 9-11, before 9-11, let me, let me say this, before 9-11, when we were organizing rallies in New York um, in support of the Palestinian Intifada, our rallies were 100, 200,000 people strong, mm -hmm. right? So strong, the streets would actually, you would feel Times Square shaking underneath your feet, right? 9-11, that was all gone. The, Palis the best of the, the Palestinian organizers and, and community of organizers were gutted, uh, either by deportations, intimidation, or outright arrest and criminalization. Um, and it wasn't until the, the first Gaza war, December 27, 2008, that we saw the resurgence of Palestinians. We saw a lot of Palestinian solidarity work happening, and it was very visible. Um, and there was a lot of secular Palestinian organizing, but it wasn't until 2008 that you saw Palestinians Arabs taking back to the streets. Um, and immediately, as soon as tens of thousands of Arabs and Palestinians were back in the street, the NYPD went straight into action in coordination with the district attorney's office. We had um, our organizations were infiltrated, Al Auda, the Palestine Right to Return, one of the oldest national organizations. Um, our core group was infiltrated by two NYPD officers. Um, the same day, even before that, I'll get to that in a second, that happened two months later, um, at the very last uh, anti-war rally in support of Palestine, the NYPD, and we could tell, I, I've been doing rallies for 14 years at this point, and I always did security, we never had an issue, NYPD was posted at every uh, you know, train, uh, train stop, and every, uh, train station, and everywhere, they could, there was another pro-Israeli rally happening with 100 people, and Governor Patterson was in attendance at the time. Rally went with tens of thousands of people without incidents. As we were leaving, all of a sudden, um, there's a stampede. Uh, cops are, are walking into our rally as we're exiting uh, on horseback, and they're macing men, women, and children, and we had the first case, the Palestine Knife. It was not a coincidence. We've never had a, a, an incident, and if we did, they were minor, they were always well resolved. All of a sudden, there's this massive, you know, calculated attack and an intent to, to criminalize and, and stop this from happening again. Within a couple of months, Al Auda gets infiltrated by two NYPD officers. These NYPD officers use the credibility of Al Auda um, in the, the Muslim and Arab Muslim uh, circles to try to get access and to criminalize other parties. Now, millions of dollars are being spent. This is a massive operation. Two years later, nothing happens. I mean, there's, you know, we don't do anything that's illegal. Uh, we are very clear on our positions, and you know, I say them, but I don't believe in the state of Israel, and I don't care to. Um, and so they can't arrest either anybody from Al Aldo or its network or any of the Arab and Muslim uh, groups that work on Palestinian issues. So they find a young man named Ahmed Farhani, who from the age, and this is the NYPD, 
who from the age of 17, the NYPD themselves, and Professor Dr. Teach is here and he was uh, a forensic analyst on that case as well. The NYPD themselves were picking him up from his home and bringing him into a mental health institution, Elmhurst and Bellevue and the like. So the only person that they can find to justify the money that they are spending on criminalizing or deterring the free speech activities and organizing around Palestine is this very mentally ill young man who can, they can even try to convince, because they hadn't convinced him, and we're sure of that, into buying guns um, for something that, you know, the, the undercover NYPD cop who we thought was a member of an AUDA would, would try to convince him to do. But talking more about the symbiosis in this, right? So, of course, al Auda was a target of, of this investigation, but, you know, we have nothing to hide and we engage in no criminal activity. During the course of, of our infiltration of al Auda, I came to represent this officer. Right? So they had staged, uh, yes, the NYPD had staged between themselves a fake uh, altercation between each other. So it was pretended that this guy, we'll call him 242, that 242 had gotten into a fight with, an, with a cop uh, during the Park Place, 9-11 Park Place rallies, right? And I came to be his lawyer, right? And this was staged intentionally with, with the purpose of having me become his attorney for two reasons, either to find me engaging in you know, uh, unethical or criminal practices or to, to find a way to preclude me from representing whoever 242 would come to incriminate later, right? So, and this is a lot, a little circular, and, and I'm gonna stop on this. I mean, okay, so we get through the case, Professor Teach, Elizabeth Fink, myself, Ahmed, uh, a few lawyers, we do a fairly good job. We get a fairly good deal. I, I think it's a fantastic deal. The case is resolved. At the same time, al is now being sued by, uh, it, during one of the rallies that happened at the same time, and, and this tells you about uh, really the, I hope, I don't know how, sorry, if this is making sense. So we're being infiltrated, we're dealing with this case, I'm representing this NYPD cop, we're still having the rallies that are coming under attack. At the one year commemoration rally, after we've been infiltrated, uh, the, the rally has ended, a bunch of uh, girls from a Muslim youth group had come from the Bronx, the rally's over, they're hanging out at a pizzeria, and uh, a, a man named John Kenny starts yelling and cursing at these girls, you terrorists, go back to your country. Another man who had, white man from Boston, had previously attended the rally, heard this, he goes back, he had a bullhorn in his hand, he starts chanting on this bullhorn, free, free Palestine. John Kenny, the man who's attacking the girls, goes up to Michael Williams and tries to hit him. He's, he's kind of, I, I think he's inebriated at the time. You know, takes the first blow, John, uh, Michael Williams, you know, falls back, he's got the bullhorn in his hand, and he backhands him with the bullhorn as he's coming up with the second bull. They both get arrested, immediately all the charges are dropped against the man who was attacking the girls and the man who attacked Michael Williams, immediately. Uh, first appearance, post arraignment in court, the only thing that the prosecutor could tell the judge to attempt to inflame uh, the courtroom and to, to persuade the judge to remand, bring back into prison, Michael Williams, is how Michael Williams kept repeating Free Free Palestine as he was chanting on the horn. That this chant, Free Palestine, justifies getting beat up by a man who just attacked a bunch of girls. So this is happening a year later, we have the case, and I can go, you know, how the, the district attorney's office turned the witnesses, the girls who were under attack, into, um, into not, not the victims, but the aggressors by virtue of being Muslim and being affiliated with a, with a Muslim youth group. I mean, I, I showed the transcripts. All I did for the entirety of the trial was objection, objection, object. I mean, I literally just, I could have done that for, you know, six, seven hours straight and, and you know, objection, that's all it took. Um, you know, I, I showed the transcript to uh, an attorney who had been practicing in the, in the appellate uh, division for 40, 50 years and he'd never seen anything like this. But to the, there's, a very intimate uh, relationship. So now there isn't much organizing happening. We've won this case, we've won that case. John Kenny, the drunk man who hits Michael Williams and attacks the girls, is now suing Al Auda because the girls and Michael Williams happen to be at a rally a few minutes beforehand. The rally had ended, and therefore they're they're now suing Al Auda. Um, so 
it, it's no coincidence then that you know when you look at the Clarion Fund, which is the organization that funded the videos which trained the NYPD, the third jihad video that tells you all the Muslims are trying to take over America and they're all evil and of course therefore Palestinians who also happen to be largely Muslim are evil and they can't be trusted and you gotta monitor and surveil them. The Clarion Fund is also affiliated with Aish Hatora, or is an offshoot of Aish Hatora, whose, uh, whose mission, funded by the Israeli government, whose mission is when you can't actually have imprisoned these people and criminalize them, then you want to uh, deplete their resources through lawfare, mm -hmm. which is what al Auda had experienced. First we were infiltrated, the, the youth membership found out that this guy who was their friend was a cop, they're scared off, we're still functioning as an organization, so now you sue, you sue us in civil court until you really, and this has happened with countless organizations throughout the history of Palestinian organizing. And, and then my last example, which is a really, I think, very sick example of the relationship, the symbiotic relationship between the, the prosecutors in New York and the, the, the Zionist groups uh, in the US and the Israeli government. May 15th commemorates the anniversary of a Nakba. That's when Palestinians commemorate the anniversary of a Nakba, the expulsion of the two thirds of the Palestinian population. This year, you know, uh, because of the infiltrations that we experienced and the, the Palestinian Muslim groups have experienced and the kind of position that the Palestinian Solidarity Movement is in and, and you know, we're trying to get our footing. Last year, there wasn't, there wasn't much, uh, much happening on the ground, right? But just in case the NYPD and the prosecutor's office was very ready, May 15, 2013, the NYPD in Bloomberg announced the arrest of 15 Palestinian men, Palestinian elders, right? And they announced that all of these elders uh, were related to, all these Palestinian men have ties to Hamas and Hezbollah and that they were, you know, transporting cigarettes for God's sake. Transporting cigarettes um, and selling them and making an increased profit because all of that money was going into the anti-Israeli resistance. Right. So we noticed that they're missing on that day. I, I'm sure it's not a coincidence. We're out looking for them. We th I, I'm thinking, you know, it's May 15th. They're all Palestinian. This has got to be like a terrorism case. Get to court, you know, and they're, they're all. It, it was a great photo opportunity. They're all in shackles. I mean... You know, there were legal aid attorneys in that courtroom that were practicing, you know, in that courtroom for 30 years who've never seen this before. There was nobody in the courtroom but them, right? They're all in shackles, and they're all shackled to each other, right? For tax evasion, supposedly, right? With a 300-plus page indictment, not a single word on any of that money go going anywhere. And I am certain, knowing <coughs> the surveillance history of these people, and having seen it, and knowing uh, the defendants, many of whom I knew personally for a very long time and who were active in Palestinian work here and back home, that this entire operation um, and that arrest happened because of three people who were under surveillance for a long time, who were very effective in their organizing, whom Israel didn't like for various reasons. They have been targets of the Israeli government for a long time. That this happened because of them. And, and for the past 20, 30 years, they haven't been able to arrest them on anything. Finally, they get financially broke. They, they buy, you know, untaxed, supposedly buy untaxed cigarettes from Virginia and they sell them for an extra $2 in New York. That's what happened. Um, but this really speaks to, okay, just make sure it's on May 15th, make sure it's these Palestinians. Now, in the recordings, the surveillance for this tax evasion operation, there are conversations and actors that are Russian and Latino and Chinese and Asian and otherwise. Not a single one of them was arrested, and we're talking about dozens and dozens of people. Not a single one of them was arrested, not a single one of them was indicted, not a single one of them was included, and it wasn't even the general Arabs who happened to be North African, it was only the Palestinians to be arrested on May 15th, 1948, on May 15th, 2013. And I'm gonna leave it on that, but I think, I hope that really hammers in um, our struggle and the need to demand, as I think George said and Al Moyali said at our old panel, to demand the, the exposure um, and transparency and the end of the Israelization of our governmental institutions in New York specifically, where we face them on a whole other level. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I no, went no, too no. long. That was <laughs> I just want to uh, speak quickly to this slide. I don't, 
Uh, is anyone in this room uh, lived in the, uh, a Midwest swing state during either of the last two presidential elections? Did you guys receive uh, a DVD that either Obsessed in 2008 or The Third Jihad in 2012? Yeah. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Aisha Torah, uh, which is actually, as Lamise put it, the exact same organization as the Clarion Fund, uh, produced uh, 17 million DVD copies of this insanely racist, uh, anti-Muslim uh, film and distribute it to every swing voter. And, and the idea was to sort of uh, charge Obama with a membership in the Muslim Brotherhood, um, if only. Um, and, uh, and I just want to make sure we're clear here, because one of the things that I, I think uh, gets lost and that Lamise only just touched on is that uh, Palestinians aren't just uh, victims of a greater Islamophobia network in the U.S. It's all Muslims are victims of uh, the Zionist network in the U.S. And as you can see here, the, the inner uh, uh, players, the, these are all the sort of uh, Zionists, and they were all the ones behind the production and distribution of this video. And the directors of those videos are the same ones who make the videos who charge SJPs with anti-Semitism. And these videos are, are, are widely available. Um, there's one made about Northeastern. There's uh, uh, a dozen made about the UC schools over the last four years. Just sort of like uh, scary music and pick, uh, like, uh, very Orientalist images of Muslim students uh, made to look like cartoon characters. Um, this, this is a, uh, uh, a staggering amount of money they have at their disposal, and what they're able to do is really uh, manufacture a new norm for this country, which is that uh, Muslims are, are, are to be feared, and that uh, it, is like, it can be a wedge issue um, in an in a election. Um, and indeed, it's being driven not by, the, the, this Islamophobia arrived on our shores not uh, after 9-11. Uh, it was, I think, expanded more broadly, but it began with uh, anti-Palestinian folks who, after 9-11, became uh, broadened their horizons. But they were, uh, the people who were driving before 9-11, the uh, anti uh, Palestinian movement have uh, graduated on into this uh, greater Islamophobia network. Um, so uh, the the important uh, uh, if we can just uh, go back to the, to campuses, um, the uh, Northeastern University Police Force uh, was dispatched. Uh, in early March, um, and uh, again, I want to make sure to, uh, that, that we bring it back. The Anti-Defamation League has held trainings each of the, uh, every, in, in every three years, it turns out, with the Northeastern Police Department. And so it should be no surprise to anyone in this room that after mock eviction notices, uh, which simulate the sort of common Palestinian experience of coming home to find that your existence in your home has been made illegal. We, we uh, distributed flyers simulating uh, the mock evictions Palestinians receive. Uh, SJP activists, student activists, uh, received visits uh, to their homes and, and calls on their phones. Uh, bang, cops, Northeastern police, uh, banged on doors and they uh, they made, uh, they, they, in, in, uh, they launched an investigation based on uh, charges of uh, a hate crime. They're investigating a hate crime because uh, Jews felt like they were uh, the victims of a hate crime when they saw a flyer that detailed the uh, Palestinian experience of uh, being evicted from their homes. And uh, the uh, the this the so, so we have 
uh, ADL trained university cops uh, criminalizing uh, the distribution of political flyers. We have um, lawsuits like the one Northeastern was threatened, uh, uh, initiated by the ZOA uh, across the country from Brooklyn College here in New York following a, a, speech, uh, a panel by Judith Butler and Omar Barghouti um, uh, to California when, and, and, and many places in between. Um, the, uh, the level of uh, rhetoric uh, used uh, by, these, by the, the Zionist network uh, translates into censorship on campuses and criminalization, as Lamise talked about, uh, on the streets. Um, so uh, th this is just uh, to, to sort of uh, speak to that, that lawfare stuff. Um, can we? Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can say something briefly to this effect, which is that, so the Title VI, um, Title VI Max described as part of the C uh, Civil Rights Bill, which is true. Um, and Jewish students are protected, I think as an ethnicity, I don't think as a religion, I think as an ethnicity under this. However, there's an attempt by Zionists to, as we've said, define criticism of Israel as anti-Jewish. The titles, the Civil Rights Office just just did an investigation on on the legitimacy of that, and what they came, what they concluded was that uh, students there's there's a reasonable expectation on college campuses to encounter views that are different from your own. So. They recognize that that's not, it does not violate the civil rights of students to not hear people disagree with them, which that's a good conclusion that they came to. But, they're, but the Zionist forces are marching right ahead with these Title VI um, lawsuits, even though they have absolutely no legal validity because they create a chilling effect. They tie up administrators and professors and students in defending themselves. And it's, they, you know, they just keep throwing, they have, plenty of money to throw at this and just create, um, but the chilling effect is not working. Um, people are, we are defending ourselves legally and with popular struggle. Um, so we can speak a little bit to some of the successes and, I mean, I think the point of what we're trying to make here is it's important to understand what we're up against. And I think Lumi in particular really spoke to what we're up against and we looks different depending on who we are. Palestinians being primarily targeted and criminalized in ways um, but that these forces are coming down on us. But in that context, we are increasing our ability to defend ourselves and to um, win, win struggles for justice. So I don't know if you want to speak some to sort of what's been happening for a ASA and that kind of thing. Or yeah, I think maybe do that for like a few minutes and then open it up. Yeah, let's do okay. a big group of people. Totally, absolutely. I think it'd be really good to have some other voices in here. So there have been a lot of successes in terms of divestment. Um, the Asian American Studies Association and the American Studies Association um, joined a cultural and academic boycott. Um, there have been, not, it is not just successful boycott campaigns, it's successful exposure of the Zionist forces so that more and more people are, are kind of questioning you know, is that actually anti-Jewish? And people are, are beginning to understand, you know, the surveillance, the way the NSA and surveillance is linked with the Zionist project, and more and more people begin to understand how their own interests, even if they're not directly targeted by Zionism, are threatened by Zionist organizations. Um, so I do think it's good to open it up to Q&A for, for folks. Thank you. Thank you. This NYPD um, incident with the um, this undercover cop, did, did you take any other action against the city? Um, it was like a fraudulent type of um, incident that they tied up the courts with. I mean, <laughs> you spent money on it. Is there any civil, civil or legal, criminal things you can do or did you do? Can, can we take a whole take bunch a of questions sure. and, and comments and then, sure. yeah, absolutely, I'll answer that. <laughs> sure. Any other questions, comments? Um, my moral comment, um, 
I we did eviction notices at Rutgers. I'm from Rutgers University SJP. I'm on the board, um, and we don't have it as bad as we do Max at Northeastern, but it's pretty bad. So when we did our eviction notices, like I took a photo of one of the students putting them under a doorway. We did it at random, and at, 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 at like all, all the campuses in, in dorm dorm rooms, and the photo overnight was in an Israeli like website. Mm -hmm. um, basically, so like uh, on one of your slides, you guys were talking about how they have like an emergency network mm -hmm. where they like tell each other. So that was very striking to me. And um, also, uh, one of a person who was a supporter of SUP and just started coming to our meetings, but wasn't uh, wasn't that involved, which changed after this event. But he um, he was on the floor with a bunch of uh, Jewish students, some of whom I mean, you know, on campus Jewish students were, were claiming that. We feel unsafe. That we uh, we felt like unsafe receiving these notices, like we were going to get kicked out. Even though the notices very clearly state that this is mock and this is just you know to show you what Palestinians have to go through, they were saying we feel unsafe, blah, yada yada. So uh, the person, what this student went up to them and said, "Is it true? Do you guys really feel unsafe?" And these were students of Rutgers Hillel, and they told them, "No, we don't feel unsafe. But this is a great excuse to get rid of SJP." So um, and that was very clearly stated to him. So it was just. Interesting to see the, the tactics and the manipulation that's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I came in late. That's okay. Um, and can we ask people to state their names? Because it would be good. To do I'm that. Sherry Gorelick, and I'm the Jew say no in the name of black. Um, have you traced the relationship between the Christian Zionist organization? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Someone in the back. That's a great. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, my name is Rajan. I'm from uh, Ryerson University in Toronto. Um, and we, the with the students union there, has just started to take on uh, some work. We just passed a motion at our annual general meeting, and um, we just started to do some organizing with Palestinian solidarity organizers on campus. And one of the things that people are really worried about is. Like our upper administration is very vocally and very visibly supportive uh, of Israel. Like our, our president goes to Israel twice a year. Um, and we've seen on other campuses across the greater Toronto area where students uh, are expelled or suspended uh, under student codes of, uh, no, student non academic codes of conduct. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if there's any. Um, like tactics or, or things that you folks have done uh, on your campuses or in your organizing that, that helps to one empower some of the students that are that are more targeted by these things, uh, but also to not just get tied up in constantly defending mm -hmm. uh, organizers and uh, limiting the, the sort of mobilization that you folks can, can take part in. Because uh, I do know that that's a real fear for a lot of students on campus. Okay, let's pause with questions there and um, respond to these and then take a few more, doing one more round. Could you kind of summarize the questions oh. for the benefit of the video? Oh, oh I see. Oh, sure. <laughs> Does anybody want to do that? I, 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 I've been taking notes. Um, he said to, oh, I thought you wanted us to summarize them all, summarize all the questions now, Stan? Yeah. Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, before we answer that. So to, to answer, I'm sorry, what was your name? Irwin. Irwin. To answer Irwin's question as to whether I, I did anything in response to being targeted <clears throat> and attacked by uh, the NYPD or, or having to expend resources defending somebody who I would later learn was, was a cop himself. Um, no, uh, you know, and, and the impact on me, but not just on me. Uh, Professor Abab Abdel Hadi was supposed to be here. On mm -hmm. many people, especially Palestinians, and I know that a lot of people who stand in solidarity with Palestinians get attacked. But it, the stakes are much higher, and the attack is much worse when it is a Palestinian who's mm -hmm. being targeted, and, and it's more vicious attack. Mm -hmm. um, extend far beyond just a waste of my resources or my time as an attorney, for example. Um, but there's a huge psychological and therefore an also, also a physical component to it, um, from being so stressed out that you get physically sick to this, you know, we don't, it was a, there's a fantastic article by Muna Barbuti, who spent time in an Israeli, she was in prison, she's a, an activist, human rights activist in Palestine, and she was spent, I don't know, how long was she in prison, I don't recall, a month, right? And there was something that resonated with me and probably every single Palestinian, which is 
you know, she happened to be in court and when she realized that she was not going home, she cried. And that was the fact that she cried devastated her more than anything else. Um, there's this taboo on us admitting to weakness and admitting to feeling hurt when we are hurt. Um, and that comes from many places. You're taught that as a child because when you're confronted by Israeli soldiers, they feed off of the fear. And so you're always forced to kind of pretend to not be afraid, no matter how scared you are. Um, you learn that overtly and indirectly and directly that you just are not allowed to be afraid in front of the soldier because they do take advantage. And that's, that's the reality of the dynamic. I mean, it's an understanding of reality. So, I mean, for me to say this, I haven't said this publicly yet, it was incredibly tolling. Um, and I did not feel safe. And it's all the harder for me to say it because my job is to protect other people and I pride myself and alhamdulillah, I don't want to jinx it, I'm, I'm pretty damn good at it. Um, and I've been doing it for a long time. So to say that I was afraid as somebody who, who does that um, w was really difficult. So, so y yeah, there's the financial, there's the fact that you know they it took up my my time, my resources, my source of income, all of that. But there are you know ramifications that are far greater, and they're very intentional. Um, not just me. We look at Professor Bab Abdul Hadi, who hasn't you know, and she's she's not facing losing really her job. I mean, there's some pressure, you know, um, and and she yeah, how stressed she she is, and she talked about this openly, and that's why I recount it. I look at the hundreds if not thousands of people in my community who are not as privileged as I am, right? They don't have a degree, they don't have citizenship, they have been arrested by the Israeli government. They, they're male, right? They're, they're older men, for example, who in the Palestinian community is a more vulnerable demographic than the female community. They have, they have less privileges by, in that sense. Um, so no, I, I haven't, and the toll, and, and thank you for, I'm talking way too long no, about no, no. this. But, and the reason that I haven't is because I, I, as an attorney, I know that I, nothing is gonna come of it. Um, literally, there's nothing that I'm gonna get compensated in the legal realm, number one. Number two, I'm gonna be made more of a target uh, by pursuing a lawsuit. Number three, I'm gonna expend more resources defending myself, and so the law, I mean, I, I see the law as a tool. It's not the leadership of any movement, it's a tool. And I will use it when I think it's beneficial. Um, in this case, it's far more beneficial for me to build a campaign around this. It's far more beneficial to say this to you. Politically, it's more productive. I'm gonna gain more, um, and they will lose more if I do this. We have no hope in the legal system in this regard at this point. Um, I, I know what's going to happen, aside from being subject to re reverse discovery, reciprocal discovery, which will only be used to, to further target and malign me. Um, many reasons not to do it. Uh, that was the long story short. But I think, I think there's a, a really uh, nice segue, and I'm just going to jump around here to my uh, uh, Canadian oh. brethren's question. Sorry, about real, real quick before you, can we just, I just wanted to point out, um, please don't take pictures of the audience because we've consented to this type of video and photography, but no one else in the room has. Sorry. Um, the, the question uh, from uh, the student in Toronto who at, uh, was describing uh, how to deal with uh, Zionist administration, especially uh, that, that's uh, really disturbing that students are being expelled for uh, supporting uh, the rights of Palestinians to uh, frankly exist. Um, the tactics I would suggest you use are, are very similar to Lamise's uh, point, which is uh, when Northeastern was uh, suspended. We, the, my first phone call since I was in law school was to the ACLU because they train you to think, you know, law is going to give you the answers. And it wasn't until, uh, my, but my next phone call was to a local labor union. Uh, and my, my phone call after that was to uh, the Boston uh, group who's uh, combating mass incarceration. Um, the uh, Having uh, AC, the ACLU uh, in, our, in our having our backs was great, but it wasn't until we, we sort of mobilized 400 people for a picket line outside the administration building at my school that we started to gain a foothold. And, and I would say that uh, while uh, legal remedies are, are tempting, um, it's really the sort of political work that's going to put pressure on your administration. And, and it's not, and, and until you are, are able to exert 
sort of political pressure with a grassroots movement, um, the, uh, the threat of a lawsuit isn't really going to uh, get you where you need to be mm -hmm. and it isn't going to stop uh, your fellow students from being targeted. I just want to quickly touch on Sherry's question about Christian Zionists, which is always an interesting thing, mm -hmm. right? Because Christians, uh, Christian Zionists want all the Jews, uh, like Toby and I, to uh, move to Israel so that uh, and have a state of Israel for us to for us to move to, so that the Messiah can come and the world can end. So, um, you know, the, the very similar short-term interest, but perhaps not the same long-term interest. I, uh, kill as many Jews as possible. Right. I mean, that's the, get them there so they'd all be killed, right? Right. And definitely. That's crazy. But um, the there's a a, a recent. Uh, uh, 513 uh, group who just got their 513 status called Christians United for Israel um, and their board members uh, one of wh um, whom is Daniel Pikes who we described earlier another is Charles Jacobs of Boston who founded camera uh, the folks who are putting up the billboards in Times Square criticizing New York Times for being too hard on Israel, which is like one of those like uh, weird things that you like you're, you think your eyes are lying to you. But um, so I, I would just say that the the links between uh, the there's no sort of daylight between the folks behind the Zionist movement and the folks behind the Christian Zionist movement. Yeah, well, what I was asking was oh, well, thank you for what you said, but uh, I was asking whether. Anybody has traced organizational ties in a more specific way? So, uh, like, uh, are you asking if some, like, uh, Pat Robertson, who runs that huge Christian Zionist church and, and many and delegations to Israel, does indeed receive money from the Koch brothers, the same sort of five plutocrats I was detailing? The QF receives all of its operating funds from Seth Clareman in Boston, the, the billionaire behind. Uh, who publishes the Times of Israel, the, uh, uh, who, who funds the ADL project uh, in New England. So, I mean, I, I think to the extent that there are, uh, th there is no daylight. There is uh, the same cast of characters are behind both. There's also like evangelical churches sponsoring settlers in the occupied territories. Um, there's like a lot of different ways that they collaborate. Okay. Um, let's take, oh, also just to say to the proactive strategy versus defensive, versus defensive, like the more, we're also seeing more like students um, kind of exposing and because like the Rayu Institute report, um, it's good that we can see that and that that's in our hands because then it's like when they're attacking with misuse of anti-Semitism, when they're, when they're coming down in all those ways, it, revealing that this is exactly what we expected to happen and this shows how they operate, and we don't think this way of operating is legitimate. Um, so there can be like two goals, the goal of divestment, but also the goal of exposure. And so it's not like we don't want to be, you know, attacked in those ways, but we're, but if you're able to reveal how those attacks are consistent with larger policies and connected to other things, that is really helpful in shifting the forces of power, just that information. So, okay, over here, and then. I was just wondering if with the Blasio, has there been any hope louder? Hope with the Blasio. He's really reaffirmed his, his oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, just one more. Uh -huh. I'm just yeah. wondering, I know Venezuela, I work a lot for Venezuela, so that solidarity, and I know um, the president of Palestine was just there, oh. and they promised to help him a lot. I'm just wondering, is that really helping? Here. Mm -hmm. Stand. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hammond. All right. Um, today, there's a memorial that was just finished for mm -hmm. Wambe Brad, who was the main organizer of the anti apartheid movement in New York City. Now, he had me, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Jewish anti Zionist, he had me speak at every anti apartheid rally. Uh, you know, in the whole struggle against apartheid. And that was very effective. It, you know, it, it, it publicized Israel's uh, uh, thing. Now, my point is 
that one of the best ways of dealing with the charge of anti-Semitism is wherever possible have anti-Zionist Jews along with you and publish literature by them, etc. And makes it, you know, I mean, uh, when you're talking about people like Bill and Poppy in, in uh, uh, Israel, okay, there are 800,000 Israelis in the United States now. They know Ilan Pop is not an anti-Semite. I mean, in other words, this is a practical, in a sense, cheap way of, of dealing with the problem. I'm not arguing against the other things that you're doing, but I'm using that as a, you know, let's go forward on that. Um, there, and then you had a question. Let's do it all Stan Heller from The Struggle. Um, it seems like you're doing a very good job of defending yourselves from these charges, even though it takes a lot out of you. Right. But there's also the question of going on the offensive, which is to talk about this myth that Israel defends Jews. Yes. Now that sounds obvious. Of course they do. No, they don't. They defend the Israeli state, the state interests, and more particularly the Israeli 1%. And for a hundred years, they've been willing to betray Jews if it would help in their project. Starting in Russia with the Kishnev massacre when Herzl was negotiating with the person who did the murders through the Nazi period, and it, even into the 80s. I was in, I'm from Connecticut. I heard Jacobo Timmerman in the middle 1980s. He was imprisoned by the neo-Nazi regime of Argentina that made Jewish women get down on their knees in, in front of pictures of, it, of Hitler. And all during those years, the Israeli government had correct and perfect relations with the junta in Argentina and sent them weapons. And you have to talk about this really sordid history. And to toot our own horn, on our strike site, thestruggle.org, we have an archive called Zionist's Dirty Secrets. We have a hundred years of articles about this kind of stuff. And that should be said in, a, in an intelligent way. I mean, it's also a very unintelligent way. I think about a year ago, some idiot made an absurd uh, video saying that the Zionists were in the concentration camps collaborating with the Nazis. I mean, that was insane. But, but the real record is hideous. And it should be out there all the time. Thank you, Stan. I'm Jim Christine Knowledge, you can't talk about the conflict, so we're going to talk about how great hummus is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. so it is part of that. Brand is right, yeah. Um, sir? Well, um, kind of two things. Um, I'm older than all of you, and some things I experienced may have been before you were born, but there was a great deal of. A little bit louder, please. There was a great deal of anti Islamic pure in this country back in 1979 at the time of, of the uh, uh, hostage crisis. Uh, no, the hostage crisis, but also the, the, the oil embargo and the oil shortage and so forth. And it, it blew out all over the country. So it's something, it, uh, racism of all sorts and bias <laughs> has existed in this country as far back as it goes. Yeah. And it just picks a new group as they come in uh, to let this kind of bias out. And, and, and there are psychological reasons for that as to where people from this country came from and why, as there are with all the rest of this. Um, but the thing I got from my father who came back from World War II and was a doctor there, um, as I had been listening to the radio and the Allies and the Axis, you know, that kind of structure, he came back and said, all the people got hurt. Really, it was a war between people in power, and all the people got hurt. And, and in, in putting it the way you do, you put it back into that vertical structure, and I think that's wrong. It's about struggles between people who are in power, they utilize other people, they use scapegoats, they use victims, they use people who are disempowered. Um, I see both Israel and Palestine as scapegoats, larger groups, um, 
I had a neighbor in my house who was an Iraqi Jew who had been chased, he and his family, out of Iraq after this, as a Jew, and had gone back to Israel and has wanted to settle it there. And it was like he said, I can't have my property in Iraq, I'm going to take it there. Um, there are victims on both sides, and there are victims the other ways. Um, the number of Jews who have been chased out of North Africa and all, all the Arab countries is a large proportion of people who are in Israel today. Um, I looked back and I heard from another group the number of anti of, of concentration camps in North Africa, which we don't we don't hear about. It was about somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 to 50 concentration camps. And there were very, very few, there were some, but there were very, very few uh, people in North Africa who gave shelter to Jews during the times of the Nazis were after them. Um, <coughs> Israel has not been very good. They have not allowed the ones who did give shelter to be placed upon, um, they have a memorial there for people in Europe who did it, but they have not allowed anybody from North Africa there. So everybody has participation in this, but it all comes from traumas from the past, from histories that go on, that get carried over. And if you look at the kinds of reactions you're talking about, they fit very well with the structure of post-traumatic stress disorder. And that these reactions have come from that, and that they're explainable that way. That doesn't excuse them, that doesn't make them right, that doesn't make them good, it makes it painful to people who are on the side of it. Yeah. But you need an understanding of that to work okay. with it. Because if you try to work at the end of fighting it, Thank you're you. fighting symptoms and you're not dealing with resources. I just want to make sure we get, uh, I think there was one more question and then I think we have about five minutes to just respond to all these questions, so. Um, well, maybe there's two more. One, two, can you make it very, oh, concise. <laughs> Go for it, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious as to uh, what kind of post-Israel state. Uh, I'm sorry, my name is Richard Solomon, by the way. I'm curious as to what kind of post-Israel state the panel envisions, given the extreme uh, external and internal forces currently there. In other words, you have uh, extreme the theocratic forces, you have neoliberal forces that would actually exert pressure, you have, okay. you have autocratic forces in that region. How, would, you know, on a practical level, I mean, I know it sounds good to have a, a democratic state, but how would, what would you envision that would encompass all these parties to make the viable and workable system? Okay. Um, two more questions really quick and then I think we need to start responding to these or we'll... Can you make it concise? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really think this question is really Trump's like question and, okay. and I, I just wanted to put an addendum to that that uh, the, the advice always to President Clinton when he was uh, meant to be President Clinton was is the economy stupid and I think in these conversations it's the Holocaust stupid Somehow they've taken the Holocaust and dusted off a covenant issue with God and converted it to a land rights issue <laughs> on the ground in Israel. That's the that's the glaring problem. We have to delink Holocaust from land rights issue. Who gave them the fucking right to make this a land rights issue? Totally. Excuse my language. Okay. But, and so I'm wondering why you, you have a tendency to walk into this trap. Why you think? Getting up and leaving the demonstration in Northeastern University when, when the, 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 de the deck is sta stacked, frankly. I wonder if you would do that. It's really my question. That is his question. Would you, knowing what you know now, if we're trying to draw attention to that bad connection, Holocaust, the land rights issue, and that di disenfranchises the current residents, thank you very much. Would you do that again, knowing what you know now? Would you walk, get up and walk out of that demonstration? And since you never got a chance to get the microphone and get the arena, get the chance to tell the message. The message is they have no right to make this connection between this awful scar on humanity, Holocaust, and convert it into disenfranchisement, which is another kind of version of the Holocaust on the ground. Okay, I think we're gonna go to um, some responses now. Um, we only have a few more minutes left. I, can, I mean, I can, do you, if you don't want to go first, yeah. okay. Um, 
there are a lot of different things that were put out. I think, I mean, Lemise can speak more to this, but as far as a post-Israel state, it, we're, we're working for Palestinian self-determination. So it's not actually, that's not, a, that's not something that I can speak to what that would look like concretely. I think we know what gets in the way of Palestinian self-determination. And I think it's our job as people who aren't Palestinian to take on the things that get in the way of Palestinian self-determination. Um, and then we'll, we'll see what that looks like. Um, I also just want to say in terms of, um, in terms of, there's a significant Zionist impact in the entire region that it, so to the point that Zionism does not necessarily protect Jews and in fact sometimes targets Jews, that includes Mizrahi Jews of the region. Of the region. So there, there's a way that Zionism itself is invested in perpetual anti-Semitism. And I think that um, certainly people are harmed by that, um, including Mizrahi Jews. But I think that it's, I don't know, I've, I've, I have a hard time with the, the trauma narrative because I think it, it ellipses the imperial forces that are behind it. Like, I think that there are things that um, people exploit. Um, I don't think imperial powers are above exploiting people's trauma. But I also in creating more of it, but it's I think when um, yeah, it just seems a little bit too close to the two people's narrative. Yeah, yeah I would just add quickly that um, if we're going to sort of uh, deploy uh, the, the uh, po PTSD narrative, it's important to understand that Palestinians then, as well as Mizrahi Jews who uh, were the victims of uh, a Mossad campaign. Uh, of blowing up mosques throughout the 60s uh, to uh, generate an exodus to Israel are also victims of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the victims become the victimizers. It, 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 I mean, maybe. But I think it's really sort of important to, to understand that as uh, Jews in solidarity with Palestinians, Palestinians must uh, be uh, supportive of uh, in a support role. And with that in mind, I'm going to give the last word. To <coughs> I mean, as it's been said, um, in the struggle in the, in the US, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. We didn't land on Israel. Israel landed on us. So to say that this is a two-way street and that you have victims on both sides is not an honest assessment of the realities on the ground. Um, and I think that there was a lot, you know, part of the struggle in the U.S. internationally, but really in the U.S., because we made a great point last night, which is outside of the United States, um, the world is largely anti-Zionist and pro-liberation, right, um, and, and anti-Israel. The, the struggles that we have are really in the United States. Um, but, you know, there is a very Zionist-centric history that's taught to us about the, the life and, uh, and history of Jews in the Arab world. And, and a lot of the history that you were referencing really comes from that, that history and is not an accurate reflection of the lives of Arab Jews, many of whom identify as Arab or Palestinian Jews. Um, and the, the tension or the attacks on Arab, uh, on Arab Jewish communities in the Arab world came either initially from Zionist organizations or later in response to uh, the dichotomization of their own identity and then the creation of the Israeli Jewish state, because that's what it was known. And the reality is, is that people who wore the Star of David were the ones who were committing these massacres from the 1900s. You can't take away from that reality. That does not by any means justify racism. I mean, in, in a, a post-Israel world, um, I would be advocating for those Mizrahi Jews who wanted to, I would today advocate for those Mizrahi Jews who wanted to get their land back from Yemen, for example, because Yemen did push out. But this is the, the post pre-1948 division. It's in response. And so for the Palestinians, it's not a PTSD, it's an ongoing trauma that's a result of realities on the ground and on the ground, as we discussed earlier, can be here, but also in Palestine. The post-Israel, and I love that word because I think that we're nearing that, possibly, hopefully. The post-Israel world, it, 
I, I think transcends the idea of even a post-Israel Palestine, right? And transcends the idea of a Palestine. Because what's happened, you know, through the colonial imposition of borders in the Arab world, and thereafter through the imposition of the Israeli state on the Arab region, is the, the division of the Arab world from itself. Um, and I would see the reintegration. You talk about these extremes, these extreme internal forces. The most extreme internal forces that I've seen are the settlers. We saw in the disengagement for the quote unquote alleged disengagement or the removal of, of settlements from Gaza. Well, you didn't have a violent Palestinian reaction and celebration of that. We, we were all quite happy. We couldn't believe it was happening, right? When you remove oppression from an oppressed people, the response is not violent. The response is joyous <laughs> and liberated. Um, issues of transitional justice to avoid you know, uh, revenge and whatnot, I mean, those are very easy to deal with if we're talking about a transitional phase where you have one person, one state, and of course it would be a Palestinian state in that dynamic and not a, a diverse Palestinian state, hopefully a democratic Palestinian state in that dynamic, and, and you have trans mechanisms of transitional justice Largely, in my opinion, they'll be to uh, allow for reparations for the Palestinians, but to avoid this kind of, you know, vendettas, blood justice, whatever you want to call it. Um, but, you know, the post-Israel model would be a, on, on some level, post-Palestine as we know it. Palestine being, you know, as, as uh, Professor Tamim al barhuti said, the, what we wear on our necks. But, but it would really transcend that, and it would be a reintegration of that particular part of the region into the region. Um, and it would not be limited to you know ethnic or identity kind of uh, politics. I don't know if that that answers your question. I don't believe in a binational state that is you know uh, cementing or codifying segregation as it is now. It's it's you know different institutions for Israeli apartheid. We just call it a binational state. Um, the the Venezuela question is a very important question. I think that what we're seeing is there is there is a slow shift in in international forces um, that challenge U.S. U.S.-Israeli hegemony, because it's not just U.S. hegemony, U.S.-Israeli hegemony. And increasingly, um, the South and the East is looking <coughs> South and East. We're looking to the BRICS countries. We're looking to South America. I don't trust he's not, I don't, you know, he is the, the, the de facto, but not by, he was not the elected president of Palestine. We don't trust him further than we can throw him. Um, and so he's irrelevant, but the relationship between Venezuela and the Palestinians is longstanding. But the idea that the Palestinian, you know, whatever authority it is shifting and building uh, reliances or relationships with Venezuela it is important because it decreases our reliance on a charity um, economy um, and on an NGO economy and on the U.S. funded U.N. Economy, so I, I think that that's very important. De Blasio has affirmed and reaffirmed his commitment to APAC in Israel. Um, what I do think De Blasio might be receptive to is the Jewish voice in New York and kind of being challenged on that. Um, that he might be receptive to that in word. I don't think it's going to be in action um, because the interests are greater than De Blasio and even just the Jewish voice. If I I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all of this land. I'd hammer out danger, I'd hammer out warning, I'd hammer out love between my brothers and the sisters. Bring it in the morning. I bring.